Okay, so tonight's topic is perhaps one of the most colorful players in the history of chess, uh, Michael Tal. Tal is uh, lovingly referred to as the magician from Riga um, because he hails from uh, Riga, Latvia, and because his games were full of um, uh, fireworks, as, as we'll see tonight. And um, as a reminder, and this is particularly for the people who are watching online because we have you know a couple hundred views for each video, it's kind of nice. Um, I'm a, a librarian by day. I don't I don't um, study chess for a living, but Warren is, is a little bit closer. Uh, he's a much better player than I, and so he's, I'll defer to him for all the analysis of the three games that we're going to be presenting tonight. So, as with Nimsevich, who we studied in our first lecture, our story begins in Riga. Um, Nimsevich lived from the late 1800s, 1880s, through, about the, through the early 1930s, and uh, Tal actually was born three years after Nimsevich died, and um, you would think that being from the same city that Tal would look up to Nimsevich, but Tal doesn't really mention Nimsevich in his studies or in his um, influences, even though uh, Nimsevich and Tal are certainly the best known players to ever come out of Riga. So we don't have a lot of information about Tal's biography, and most of my lectures have been doing biographical sketches of the players that we look at. Today I'm going to do more of a psychological uh, profile, and that's for a couple of reasons. First, because Tal's play style is so different from what we've seen so far with Nimsevich, with Alyekin, with Botvinnik, with Smyslov, he's he's a very different kind of player, for one. Um, but he combines elements of all those players. And for two, we don't have a lot of information about his early childhood. I used as my source um, this book, which is basically an autobiography called The Life and Games of Mikhail Tal, which he wrote in 1975 and which was updated after his death uh, by John Nunn. And um, I thought that he was going to start by saying, you know, my father, my mother, my brother, my this, that, the other. He does not. He starts directly with chess. You know, my first game of chess, blah, blah, blah. So I've been able to piece together a little bit of information about um, about Mikhail Tal, who everybody called Misha, and hopefully you'll know him well enough by the end of this lecture to call him Misha yourselves. Um, his father was a physician. His grandfather was a pharmacist. His older brother was a physician. His firstborn son was a physician. And Tal was a, uh, a chess player and a teacher. And he said something pretty interesting in his autobiography. He says, in our family, all men were medics. My grandfather was a pharmacist. My father was a doctor. My older brother was a doctor. My son is also a doctor. The only man who played black with medicine was me, and medicine probably took revenge on me because of that. We'll, we'll get to the, the health concerns here in a bit. Um, but the, the point is, is that Nimsevit, or sorry, Atal branched off from the path that his uh, family did, and he kind of did his own thing. Now, um, Tal was considered a genius from a very young age. Not only did he do all this stuff in chess, but he started reading at age three, which if you know anything about childhood development, you'll know is about as early as you can possibly learn to read, and something a very small percentage of kids actually do. And um, because he started reading so early, and because he was a voracious reader who devoured everything, he progressed very rapidly. In fact, he graduated high school at the age of 15, and he entered university at the age of 15 and a half. In fact, he qualified, and he was originally thinking of studying in the School of Law, but the problem was it was a four-year program which would put him graduating at around 19 and a half, and you couldn't practice law until you were 21 in Riga at the time, and Tal had no desire to do nothing for a year and wait until he turned 21. So instead he entered the faculty of literature, he, uh, which they called philology at the time, and he graduated with a degree in literature, the equivalent of a bachelor's degree, became a school teacher essentially at age 19, right out of fresh out of college. So that is kind of a parallel track to all these things that he's doing in chess. We call him a genius, we look at his rise as pretty quick, but in fact um, his rise was was somewhat more linear until he got to about age 
15, 16, and then it became what I would say more of an exponential curve. If you were to be able to plot it on a, a FIDE rating, which of course we can't because FIDE rating didn't, didn't uh, exist at that time. But he was a fourth category player at age 11. He started playing at age eight uh, because he observed a game in his father's uh, waiting room and, and thought it looked fun, so he wanted to play. Played a cousin, got scholars mated, got very disillusioned and wanted to get a lot better at chess. And so he went to a local club called the Young Pioneers Club and he just observed, he just absorbed. And by age 11, he was a fourth category player, which I mean, I guess now would be kind of like a class C player, maybe 14, 1500 FIDE, or sorry, USCF. Um, and Bodvinik was actually in town, and Bodvinik was uh, on vacation in Riga, you know, wanted to go down to the ocean. And, um, and an 11-year-old Mikhail Tal went and knocked on his door with a little chess set under his arm hoping to play, you know, the, the, um, the soon-to-be world champion. And he was turned away at the door by uh, Bodvinik's wife, who said that he was sleeping, so he couldn't be disturbed. Uh, that he needed his rest. And so he was very little d disappointed Tall, um, who thought himself, you know, able to, to hold his own against Botvinnik, returns home. Botvinnik was his idol, as were a lot of, the idol of a lot of players at that time, young, you know, Russian boys. At the age of 12, he's, he skipped over third category altogether and um, skipped a second category. So he's now maybe 17, 1800 USCF. And he represents the Latvian team at the age of 12 in a Baltic tournament. Then he goes on to, um, to play in the adult tournaments, plays in the first championship, uh, his first championship of Latvia at age 14, finishes like seventh or eighth. Um, age 15, Karras was in town for a simul. At this time, Karras is probably top three in the world. And um, he played 10 boards simultaneously. And um, Tall was, a, was one of two people to score a win. The other person to score a win was also a future grandmaster and a future champion of Latvia as well. So, um, so he showed a lot of promise. And at age 16, he wins the championship of Latvia. Now, Tal is a, um, is a modest guy, and he doesn't think this is a very big deal. He says, well, of course I won because I was a first-year university student. You see, the champion of, the, uh, of Latvia for the two years preceding Tal and the two years after Tal were all five of them were first-year university students. So Tal just thought it was destined since he was the only first-year university student in the tournament. Of course he would win. So... Um, he did, and then the next year he didn't win because he wasn't a first-year university student anymore. Someone else who was a first-year university student did. Um, at age 18, he becomes a master officially. Remember, at this time, FIDE is not uh, firmly established. There is no uh, rating criteria or norm criteria to become a master. To be a Soviet master, you had to beat another master, um, and he did by eight to six in match play with uh, a, a master Sagan that I've never heard of. And at the same year, he defeats um, a pretty strong GM, Averbach, in uh, a tournament match. So he is a candidate master. He has to wait for the official letter from the Soviet Chess Federation who has defeated a grandmaster in tournament play and everybody starts to really scrutinize him at this point. They think, wow, this, this guy's gonna go somewhere. Um, at age 21, he becomes the champion of the USSR, and um, he is a master, but he's not an international master. And essentially, FIDE, and he, you know, he hasn't played in enough international tournaments to even have enough grandmaster norms. But FIDE makes him a grandmaster from candidate master, just like jumps him up in, a, in one of their congress meetings because he won the USSR championship and because it also allowed two Americans to, to become GMs without meeting all the criteria. Um, Arthur Biskier, how is that pronounced? Biskier? I've always heard of Biskier. Biskier was, was uh, kind of in exchange for, um, for Tal getting his uh, GM title. And at age 24, as we'll discover, he beats Budvinik and becomes, at that point, the youngest person to ever win the world championship. He was later, um, later Kasparov, 
became world champion at a younger age. But he was a uh, someone who, who had a kind of a linear progression, then a meteoric progression. And I would really, and I think Tao would agree, ascribe his success to um, going under the tutelage of Alexander Koblenz. And I've also seen Koblenz with a CS at the end instead of a TS. Um, Koblenz was a Latvian player who was a very strong master, competed internationally, um, kind of peaked, I guess, in probably the 1930s and early 1940s, was never really a, a contender for a world championship, but he certainly did well in international tournaments. And he took Young Tao under his wing from about 1949, um, and he coached him really all the way through his world championship uh, events matches both the first and the second so through 1961 for sure and they remained friends and trained together even afterward you know you see training games from them through the late 60s even um koblenz was called maestro by all the uh young chess players of of latvia and he also became a very important trainer for the soviet chess federation so he was also quite involved with uh players from the other you know the i guess the principal part of the uh, of the USSR as opposed to just the Baltic states. So uh, Tal certainly benefited greatly from his tutelage, um, particularly in his openings and in his regimen and his training regimen. He benefited from Koblenz telling him, okay, let's stay up and analyze this position, you know, because we've adjourned and we need to analyze it so you can go in tomorrow and figure out which you know how to continue and he also benefited from Koblenz saying okay sleep you need to sleep bringing him breakfast you know these are little things that sound kind of obvious but Tal was not the most um, he was extremely focused and extremely thoughtful on the chessboard off not so much he would forget to eat he would forget to do this that and the other he was useless in a kitchen so he kind of needed uh, he kind of needed that help so in preparation for the, the first game that we're going to see tonight, let me show you the cross table from the first Soviet championship that Tal won. This was in 1957, again, when Tal's at the tender age of 21, and this is what led to him becoming GM. And if you look at the opponents that, um, that Tal defeated to win this tournament, to win it outright by half a point over Karras, you'll see that these are some of the strongest players, not just in the USSR, but in the world at the time. Um, I would say that that probably seven of, the, seven of these players are probably in the top 10 in the world um, at that time, if, if you, know, you could access the ratings there. So it was a very, very impressive performance. And you'll see that he did it with only two losses. Two losses, you know, the rest for either wins or draws. That's in that field that was very, very impressive. And when you add to the fact that this was a 21-year-old competing in his second championship of the USSR, it's extremely impressive. So for the first game, we're going to look at Tal's game in this USSR championship against the number five finisher, Alexander Tolush. And for that, I will turn it over to Warren. Thanks, Lucas. And I think later we're going to look at some pictures of tall stairs <laughs> yes. the board, right? Uh, yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll give you good context after this game to give you an idea of what his opponents were literally looking at. Okay, Cho Choosing games for tall was uh, pretty difficult. So if I left out your favorite tall game, then I will apologize in advance. But I think these games are... It's kind of hard to find a boring tall game, so... Anyway, so here uh, Lucas already told the context. So this is a USSR championship playing Toulouse. Uh, I don't know what his ranking was with respect to other players. Uh, I know he was definitely one of the top five in, in Russia, I would say. Uh, but there were a lot of famous names on that list. You probably saw Mark Taimanov, Petrosian, Korchnoi, Spassky, a lot of... Bronstein, Karras. Yeah. Either world championship challengers or world champions, in the case of Petrosian and Spassky. So, this was one heck of a tournament. Definitely one of the the strongest that you'll you'll see in a cross table. Um, so anyway, let's get started. So, Tall liked to play this when he wanted to avoid 
an opening to spew e. He, of course, generally preferred e4. But he would play c4 if he wanted a different kind of game. So this is the king's Indian defense. And now, Samish. Right. <laughs> All right, so here e5 is kind of, uh, it's slightly dubious. Toulouse played this on purpose, I think, just to see if Tall might take on e5, or to just mock him either way. I think it's kind of amusing that you would play this. Normally, black would just castle, and then you might play e5 later on. But giving Tall the option of going into endgame is kind of funny. I'm sure Tall did not even for a second consider taking on e5. So this is all somewhat typical for this opening. Sometimes the bishop rests on e3, but g5 is also fine. Now, here is a... Uh, yeah, back up one minute. Here is kind of a, a typical moment where you want to try to play principal chess here. So, nowadays, after d5, uh, most GMs are going to know by instinct that you're going to have to open up the position somehow. Because white has a lot of space on the king side. Now, some of you may be familiar, some of you may be not, but this position kind of harkens you to the Yugoslav variation against the dragon. And in, there, in that variation on the Sicilian defense, white is going to attack on the king side. And white's well placed to do that here because white can easily play g4, h4, h5, try open the h file, try to exchange dark squared bishops, and somehow magically deliver checkmate. So something along the lines of, I should have got the mouse actually. But. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. So white's going to try to play something along the lines of this. And after exchanging bishops, the queen's going to come down and then checkmate. Right? This is the ideal situation for white anyway. Obviously black can prevent this, but that's white's goal. So given that white's idea is to attack on the king side like that, I'll just eliminate all the arrows, uh, you want to open the position because when someone has a flank attack, you need to counter in the center. That's the classical response anyway. So black's move of the game, c5, really black is already in a very difficult spot because he has no counterplay in the center. The center is closed, so white will just have an attack on the king side that black can really do nothing about. So really black almost lost the game already at this point. So a better idea, like I said, would have been a move like C takes D5, followed by like A6, B5, Queen A5, try to open up the position somehow, or attack on the Queen side. So this was Black's first key mistake. I just wanted to point that out. Because otherwise it might seem like White just won out of nothing, like Black did nothing wrong. So this was a crucial mistake that Black made. Like I said, G4. And why it's just slowly migrating these pieces over to the king side. Now it may look odd moving this knight to g3 at first sight because it looks like it has no destination. Because f5 is covered by a pawn and so is h5. Of course, if you know tall, you probably know that this is not a barrier, that a pawn could take his knight. This is not an issue. You'll see his idea later on. But uh, this kind of idea with sacrificing the knight on the king side, it's very commonly seen in like close re Lopez type positions. So that's also a different opening. But uh, in any event, this is not something that Tall invented. But it's not something he might be doing either. So again, white wants to trade these dark squared bishops. Try to reduce the defenders black has on the king side. White's getting one step closer. And here, the computer wants white to just take on b5. But Tall has no inkling towards taking pawns and opening up the position for black on the queen side. Instead, he just castles. And now we have an interesting moment. Black tries to take on c4 to try to open up the queen side because he has no counterplay in the center, like I already said. So here is an interesting moment. So should white take on c4 or should white retreat the bishop? What, what about with the bishop? What was that? Leave it. Leave it? Leave it? <laughs> I didn't give you that option. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, yeah uh, you mean on G6? Yeah, G6, and then once you take the bishop, then the next one, H. Yeah, h here, uh, I, I, I'm I quite certain that Toulouse would have just taken the pawn. And okay. Yeah, now you can say the bishop, although this might be somewhat premature because now black's queen can join in the defense, and I think this is pretty significant here. So although it is clever, I, I think it's... Uh, I, no offense, but I would classify this as hope chess, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now back to the choices I gave you. Do you think I should retreat the bishop to, say, c2, e2, or b1, f1, or b1? Okay, why, why should white retreat the bishop and not take this pawn? Hmm. Okay. So you're. Here's a defense, and over there is attack. So you're saying on b1 it helps defend the queen side and attack? It, yeah. On the king side? Defend, okay. Plus it has over there attack. No, it is true. It does turn out that the bishop will actually be useful on this uh, diagonal. Mm -hmm. But uh, that may not be so evidently obvious because the bishop is blocked by the pawn e4, and it's not clear what's going to happen with that. Uh, Although I think Tall did have visions of this. I think he did not want to take on c4 because the bishop is vulnerable there. Black can attack it with a knight, say knight d7, b6, or rook b8, b4, and it'll just further Black's plans. And it, it eliminates one more pawn from the c file. And if we look at this position, after what he played bishop b1, there are two Black pawns on the c file. And this is actually impeding Black's counterplay. It's going to make it much harder for Black to nice get anything going. Exactly, <coughs> yeah. So really, the usefulness of extra pawns are in if they control squares or if you can make queens out of them. If they don't control important squares and if the pawn is not going to queen, then it's basically useless. So I think that's really why he told him not to take on c4. The Black pawn represents no threat. It's obviously not going to queen. And d3 and b3 are not important squares of control here. So looking at it from that perspective, there's no reason to get rid of the pawn. So I, I think that's, I mean, it's hard to say exactly what someone was thinking. I don't think he commented on this, but that's the line of logic you would use in this kind of position. I, I would use, anyway. So black tries to refrain from having one of his defenders traded. And now white is preparing this knight move to f5. Obviously here, black cannot take the knight because the g file is just deadly here. Only way to block, and black's going to get wiped out. So black can't even consider this. Here, it's pretty difficult to say what black can do. I mean, I, I'm really not sure uh, if he can really play any good defense here. Uh, I've never seen analyses that really look at alternatives. Now that four tall is trying to open another front, namely the F file, right? Now black finally gets the E5 square for his knight, but it's not very useful. Now here, white could have taken on D6. Black, this move does hang the pawn. But Tal does not want to do this because he can trade queens after, say, queen f6. White can try to resist, but it just helps black activate pieces. So Tal didn't worry about taking this pawn. So with f4, white is trying to open that second front and, hopefully, guide this black e-pawn away so you can open up this guy, this bishop on b1. So white opens up the h file. Now white intends to leave the bishop back and then mate on h7, right? Threatening h7. Hold on. Question. Sure. If he threatened the queen, what would happen there? You, you have a queen threat and check. Queen takes a check. Queen is. Queen where? Oh, you're right. Okay. There's a check. <coughs> so bishop g5 
And then, but I didn't see the check down here. Oh, Basically, yes, it's with check, yes. But the can take it and then check again. Yeah. yeah. Although, even if it was not check, like say if the White King runs yeah. D1, yeah. it does not work because, like for example, uh, imagine the King's on D1. If queen G, if bishop g5, queen g5, queen h7, king f8. Yeah, yeah and, and white has nothing. So uh, one thing about bishop f4, the point is that if, if black takes here, white can take and then play queen h6 and then take this guy. So that's white's idea. And the black king remains open. All right, so black has no other way to defend h7, so knight f8 is practically forced. And now with queen h6, white's threatening bishop g5, followed by bishop f6, and it will be made on g7. So again, black doesn't have much choice. So black plays knight g6 to stop bishop g5, f6. Now if bishop g5, black can play f6, right? This is his idea anyway. And like Brian said, e5. And pretty remarkable move, right? The whole idea is to open up that bishop on b1, and eliminate one more defender. It also does another thing, it opens up the square on e4 for the knight, which turns out to be pretty useful. So it's, it is pretty remarkable. Uh, you know, it, it is kind of easy to find some tall moves if you just say, oh, what would tall play? Oh, he'd sack a piece, okay. <laughs> so these puzzles are not always the hardest, I guess, but it's, it's still instructive. Uh, e5 is very strong. It, it, it takes my computer, anyway, a second to realize this is good. At first, you play e5, and it goes, this is stupid. But it does not realize what white's intending here. Looks like black hasn't moved anything. The pieces are almost in the same spot they were. Yeah, they're almost all in the back rank. It's kind of sad, right? But again, black's opening choice kind of condemned them to that position. Closing the position when white had a space advantage and attack on the king side wasn't so good. Anyway, so black doesn't have a lot of choice here. So if black were to take on g5, how would white proceed? Yeah, a uh, pawn push, uh, it still looks hard to defend black's position, but bishop takes g6 looks like the most clear. I mean, if, if h takes g6, you have queen h8, king f7, and then Yes, very nice, very nice. Rook h7, knight h7, followed by rook f1. And it's pretty nasty, right? Bishop f5, and it's pretty much over. And if knight takes g6, of course, queen h7, followed by, I think, just queen takes g6. And this rook coming down looks pretty devastating. So I don't see a defense here for black. So the bishop on g5 is untouchable. But he's got to stop this threat to f6. So that's why he played rook to c5. Now, getting rid of one more defender. Black again doesn't have much choice. He can't take the bishop either way, right? If h takes g6, how does white win? Sacks the queen? Yeah, queen, queen h8, and then f, uh, f7, and then rook. Rook? Wait, if, if knight takes rook. Rook up to h7, and if he takes it, then you get the queen. OK, you're saying white made a queen sacrifice. OK, no, now after rook h7, what if uh, king e8? Okay, bishop takes f6, queen b6. Rook checks and then queen takes knight. Rook checks. Rook checks on e7. Rook takes, rook takes e7. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, bishop takes f6. 
Bishop h6, okay. <coughs> yes, this looks like the win. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I don't see any defense to queen takes f8. Well, you know, black doesn't get to be careful at rookie seven, though. You know, I, I think the line with bishop f6 was probably sufficient. Um, and after queen b6, uh, take any five work. Knight a4 might also be crushing here, too. The idea is that after something like queen b4, you just take on e5. And here I don't see what black's going to do. White's going to take on d6, and this looks, yeah, this looks bad. So yeah, knight a4 is a key move there. But yes, uh, by the way, I don't think Tall saw all these variations. Uh, the, way, the way he played and understood chess, I think, it's more along the lines of creating problems for your opponent to solve. So Al Yakin was similar to Tall in that he tried to create complicated positions, but he, he, wanted, he was obsessed about the truth of things. He analyzed lots of variations and was very, very upset if his sacrifice wasn't correct. Tall, on the other hand, couldn't care less, basically. As long as it worked, that was good enough for him. Yeah. So he was more about creating practical problems for his opponent. That was kind of the way he looked at chess. So he would see a move, and he would think, oh, I really would not like to be my opponent in that position. Yeah, let's play it. <laughs> you know, some people might hate going, going into those kind of imbalanced positions where you have an attack or simply gain of time for a piece, but he didn't care. He was that kind of risk taker. So anyway, going back. So again, after at bishop takes g6, knight takes is bad. Queen takes h7. And it's the same story here. Bishop h6. And it's all very nasty, right? Here, white's up a piece. So rook d7 is practically forced. Now white's last piece joins in the attack. It's kind of a pretty position to look at. All of white's pieces are bearing down on the black king. It's definitely a picture of harmony here. So now black, white's threatening f6. So again, black doesn't have much choice. Taking is almost forced. Um, now rook f1. And white's threatening. Oh, what is white threatening? Y'all see? Well, rook takes, say black played some innocuous move. If rook f8, queen f8, queen h7 isn't mate because of that guy. Doesn't mean it's not winning, however. <laughs> Certainly can win the queen. Okay, bishop h7, black cannot take because then it really would be mate. So king f7 is the only move. Um, <coughs> interesting. So if rook f1, it, it's somewhat complicated. It's probably still winning for white, but black does have this. Uh, get a piece. Knight d6 does look good, although king e7 is still not entirely clear looking to me. I think the clearest is probably queen f6 here, king e8, knight d6. And now black's going to lose his queen for sure. King d7, just queen f8, and otherwise you got to sack the queen for the knight when white has a decisive material advantage. And probably mate's also coming with bishop g6 and rook h8. So yeah, this... This is one of white's threats. White probably has multiple wins here, uh, but this is something black has to deal with. 
So, black gets rid of the knight. But unfortunately, white is left in exchange up here, and the attack is still running. So black's trying to do something to defend himself, but he's got too many weaknesses. At this point, it's nice to see Tall finish it off. Threatening Rook F8. And now Tall plays a cute tactical stroke, just takes on A6. Can't take the bishop because of what? Yep, Rook A, right? Black's back rank is indefensible. So the bishop is untouchable. So king h8, leaving room to bring the rook back to g8 now. But now bishop takes h7. Just removing one more defender from the black king. Now, of course, if rook h7 had his white win. <laughs> yeah, again, rook a8. Black can sacrifice his pieces one at a time on the back rank, but white will take them all. Knight, bishop, queen, right? So the bishop is untouchable, and at this point it's really hard to find anything for black. And finally, black resigned. So black just could not withstand the pressure that Tall put on him here. So yeah, I, I think this is a... <coughs> A pretty fun game in the in the style of Tall right here. Uh, yeah, that's all I had for that though. I said that uh, I said that we were going to look at Tall's psychological profile a little bit. Um, before that, I just want to show you the cross table of the 1958 USSR Championship, which was of course we, the match we saw was from 1957. Again, Tall finishes with a clear lead, half point win this time over Petrosian in second. And again, if you look at the uh, top players, you'll see pretty much all of them there, except for uh, Botvinnik and Smyslov, who uh, didn't play. And so you'll see that um, after Botvinnik and Smyslov, pretty much Tal is, is at the top. And if you look at his performance ratings, he peaks around 1960 with the World Championship win. So he's definitely on the, on the upswing here. Um, so let's talk about a couple of aspects of his personality. On the one hand, Tao was a likable guy. Um, Botvinnik says he was loved. Isn't, isn't it this that constitutes happiness? He was um, liked by everyone. He had no enemies. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is he had an overabundance of passion just for chess and for life, really. He loved going out and being with people. He loved playing chess. He would not turn away anyone who wanted to play a game, whether it was blitz or whether it was analyzing position or whatever. He was open with himself. Um, and that contrasts somewhat sharply with Botvinnik, who liked to kind of keep to himself and, and study his own stuff and not really share his stuff with everybody else because you know, it was it was his knowledge that he had accrued, and Tal was the opposite. He was a sharing guy, um, and even the people that he played against off across the board, even though he was a a, a a recalcitrant opponent, that he would just not give up. Would not always, very rarely, would he just accept a draw, just because he kind of wanted to play it out. Um, that still people couldn't be upset by that. Spassky said, I was on excellent terms with Tal. We never had a single dispute, although we always battled desperately at the board. Misho is perhaps the only great player who was unaware of any feeling of envy. So Tal had a, a remarkable attitude that people remarked on. However, across the board, Tal was a tough opponent and he played mind games with people. Um, he was known for his stare. And as you can see from the young Tal and the old Tal, it never went away. He had that for all of his life. And, um, and people would wither under it. Not everybody. Some people were composed and, and were not really um, intimidated by it. For example, Kurt Korchnoi, Spassky later on, um, and Budvinik, they, they weren't really phased by it. But it certainly had an impact on other players, like Fisher. Um, Tal intentionally played mind games on people when he could, and he did that in a number of different ways um, that we're, we're going to get to, but uh, he, would, he would stare at his opponent. And oftentimes, what's really funny about it 
is, you know, you think that he's sitting there calculating all these variations, you know, and he's, he's thinking about the game and this, that, and the other. Sometimes he was just staring at people and thinking about something completely unrelated to chess. Um, he talks about, and this is from his book, uh, and I think it's just hilarious. He, he's talking about a game he plays against Grandmaster Vasyukov in the USSR Championships. And they reach a really complicated position. He says, um, I was intending to sacrifice a knight. The sacrifice was not altogether obvious, and there were a large number of possible variations. But when I conscientiously began to work through them, I found to my horror that nothing would come of it. Ideas piled up one after another. I would transport a subtle reply to my opponent, which worked in one case, to another situation where it naturally proved to be quite useless. As a result, my head became filled with a completely chaotic pile of all sorts of moves and the famous tree of variations from which the trainers recommend that you cut off the small branches, in this case spread with unbelievable rapidity. Then, suddenly, for some reason, I remembered the classic couplet by Korne Ivanovich Tchaikovsky. Oh, what a difficult job it was to drag out of the marsh the hippopotamus. And then he goes on to talk about how he would how he was sitting at the board thinking for 45 minutes about how he would drag a hippopotamus out of the marsh, you know, with levers and helicopters and engineers and this, that, and the other. All the while, his opponent's thinking he's thinking of this complicated move. And um, and then finally, he says, you know what? I don't know how to do it. Let the hippopotamus drown. And he says, um, I somehow realized that it was not possible to calculate all the variations, that the night sacrifice was, by its very nature, purely intuitive. Since it promised an interesting game, I could not refrain from making it. The following day, day it was with pleasure that I read in the paper how Mikhail Tal, after carefully thinking over the position for 40 minutes, made an accurately calculated peace sacrifice. <laughs> So sometimes he's staring and he's not actually thinking about chess, um, and sometimes and sometimes he's just trying to make his opponent nervous. There's a, another story that Tao relates where he's playing Fisher, and this is when Fisher was 16 years old and hadn't competed much against the Russians internationally. And Fisher wrote down a move on his score sheet, uh, like moving his rook, you know, from B to D1 or something. And, and then looked at Tal to see how he would react. This was before FIDE, obviously, recently in May, made it illegal to do that. Now you have to make your move and then write it down in your score sheet. But Fisher, right, a 16-year-old Fisher writes down his move on his score sheet, and it's a move Tal doesn't want Fisher to make, but he doesn't really know how to communicate that to Fisher. So he's thinking, well, I can't look you know, concerned by it because then he'll know that it's a good move and he'll go ahead and make it. I also can't look like I'm, I'm probably not a good enough actor to just kind of try to act like I'm, you know, smirking at it, that I'm not really concerned by it. So what Tal does is he gets, just gets up, he goes walk, he walks around, he goes talks to another player who's, you know, walking around too and makes some sort of joke and they laugh. And uh, Fisher thinks they're, they're laughing about the position. And, um, and the candidate move and gets all unnerved. So he comes back and Fisher marks it out and makes a different move. And Tao goes on to win and beats the young Fisher. And in the postmortem, um, tells Fisher, yeah, I really didn't want you to make that move. And, and Fisher said, I, I thought you were just laughing at it, that it was not a, you know, so mind games are certainly a, a big part of Tao's uh, repertoire. He was also extremely calculating and cunning in how he would um, approach the game itself for example, used to, you'd play for five hours, and if, um, if a result was not entered, you would adjourn for the evening, and then you would make up your match on another day, maybe on a day that you, had a, that you finished another match, maybe on a rest day, but you would adjourn it. And um, Tao made excellent, excellent use of adjournments. He was perhaps the best modern player I've encountered thus far in my studies for adjournments because he had such energy and such little need for sleep that he could stay up until 5 a.m. analyzing all sorts of positions and possible continuations and come back to the game with a crafty plan. It could be that he was going to somehow get a draw by forcing a Zung Zwang or forcing a, a potential stalemate or a repetition or something, or it could be that he was going to be able to to eke out a win from a slightly advantageous position. But he's very good at that. He was also very good at 
at playing around with sealed moves. See, what would happen is that the person who had to move when the time control was reached, they would have to seal their move. They'd have to put it in an envelope, write down what move they're going to make, seal it, and then they would adjourn and they'd come back the next day, and then that opponent would have to make that move. And Tao would almost inevitably force his opponent to seal their move instead of him sealing his move. That way he could kind of figure out what they were going to move and limit it to three or four possibilities and go through all the different continuations that were possible for them. He also knew what his opponents liked and didn't like. He knew that Averbach, for example, loved having clear games where everything made a lot of sense and there were no real complications on the board, you know, and he knew that uh, Botvinnik preferred positional play, and so in certain cases, he would intentionally play to his opponent's weaknesses. And this could be by making a sacrifice that complicates things enormously. We will see a, a couple of those. It could be that he wants to keep the queens on the board to allow as many possibilities as possible so that um, so that there's less chance of a draw and there's more chance of a, you know, you stay in the middle game longer as opposed to transitioning into an end game. This worked against a lot of players. There are a couple players it did not work against. It did not work against Korchnoi, uh, against whom Tal had a losing record. It did not work uh, very well against, um, well, it worked okay against Spassky. It worked okay against Petrosian. But it worked really well against players like um, Larson. Tal had a very favorable record against Larson and a winning record against Fisher and a winning record against a lot of other really strong players because he knew how to play to their weaknesses. And. The last aspect of his personality, I think that's really important to talk about, is he was a scholar. Tao was not just a literature major who had a degree in literature and who taught literature and who incidentally uh, had to tell his students that they couldn't have autographs in you know, the grade books because you know, he was the teacher and they had to treat him like the teacher. Um, he read constantly. He would be at the dinner table with a book, and his wife would be at the dinner table with a book, and his daughter would be at the dinner table with a book. He would be watching television and have a book in his hands. He would get up before anybody else in the family and read chess magazines, study positions, study games, this, that, and the other. He worked hard. It wasn't just genius. He was a hard worker. He didn't get involved in politics. Now, in if you're here for the Soviet School of Chess Lecture, you know that Botvinnik was kind of wrapped up in politics, sending letters to the Central Committee and this, that, and the other. Um, Tal stayed away from all of it. You know, he didn't want to get involved. He didn't want to make any comments that would be considered anti-communist. He didn't want to give speeches or, you know, use his time abroad to, to you know, party or engage in capitalist activities. He, he just wanted to keep low, fly under the radar. Um, and this is at a time where players were under a lot of scrutiny, particularly post-1976 after Korchnoi defected. After that, pretty much every major Soviet chess player had a KGB agent or agents assigned to them specifically. And of course, Tal being the, the nice guy that he was, he actually became friends with the KGB agent assigned to him. Um, he, that said, he didn't necessarily conform to the ideal. And, and one anecdote that his daughter related is that they had seven televisions at home. Now, this is in the Soviet Union in the 1970s, where you know families would be lucky to have one, perhaps two televisions. But Tal had a television in the kitchen and in the bathroom because he liked watching television. He liked keeping abreast of what was going on in the news. But of course, one thing wasn't enough for him to do. He needed to be watching television, having a conversation with someone, reading a book, all at the same time. You know, he needed to, to multitask. So all of those aspects of his personality, I think, are important to understand um, part of his success that he had boundless energy, that he had boundless enthusiasm for chess, that he didn't care to get involved in politics, that he was a fierce competitor, but he was a really nice, well-liked guy who everybody got along with and who happened to be extremely witty. Um, one other funny story I like about Tall is uh, a filmmaker approached him in the early 1990s, very close to when he died, and said that he was doing a profile on the 13, at the time, the 13 world champions, and he wanted to get permission from Tal to, you know, to portray him in his documentary and that he had, you know, discussed it with the other world champions. 
And um, and so Tall said, oh, so you've gotten, so you've talked it over with Steinitz. Those Steinitz have been dead for almost 100 years. So, you know, just just little quips like that. You know, he was, he was a very witty person. But we saw in that last match that Tal used a sacrifice. And I just want to point out a couple of different types of sacrifices that, that Tal did and was not afraid to do. And, and so you can see kind of his rationale. So let's play a game, white to move. Uh, black has just played his bishop to b7, threatening the queen. You are Tal, your move. Take the free knight. Where's the free knight? Take the knight on f6. With the bishop or with the pawn? <laughs> that is indeed what Tal did. Takes, takes the knight on f6. And um, uh, Koblenz, this is his mentor, and this is a training match that they were playing in 1965, happily snaps up his queen. Um, Tal takes the knight, uh, sorry, uh, then captures more material. He, he uh, bishop takes bishop on on uh, on f3 there, and Tal ends up promoting that pawn and to a knight of all things, so he can deliver check. And then he promotes the uh, another pawn too and gets a queen and wins an, in an endgame um, with uh, an extra pawn. Actually, is all all that came of it. But Tal somehow saw that just grabbing that knight, you know, on f6. And sacrificing the queen, no big deal. That eventually it would it would lead to a, a favorable win for him 15 moves later. So that that's a pretty big um, commitment to make. At least queens. That that scares me. And people would joke, you know, and say, uh, so, uh, Mr. Tal, how how do you think about? you know, a move. And he'd say, well, first I think about how I'd sacrifice my queen, then I think about how I'd sacrifice my rook, then I think about how I'd sacrifice my bishop or knight, and then if none of those works, then I just make a good move. Um, and he says that halfway jokingly. So here, yes, and, and this is just like Tall just saying, okay, take my queen, I'm going to get something out of it. And I kind of think of this as kind of a passive sacrifice. He just sits back and lets it happen and gets something else out of it. He loses material, and what he gains is either um, exposing attacking lines or he gains temp tempi, he gains uh, a slight time advantage or a development advantage, or both. That's what I see commonly in those sacrifices that Tal makes where he just lets pieces get taken. And then you have active sacrifices. Again, you are uh, Tal and it's your move. And again, black has played the bishop to b7. What do you do? Knight f5. No, that was not not what was played. I couldn't tell you if take if the pawn. you take the pawn. He he sacks the knight on e6. He takes the pawn on e6, and uh, black obviously recaptures. But this is uh, this is exposes the king to an attack. Now, we have the advantage of computer analysis. And a lot of times when you look at Tal's sacrifices, the computer says that wasn't good. The computer is an able defender and could figure out how to defend, hold on to that material advantage, and convert it into a win. But as Warren said, Tal didn't think of it that way. He thought, is this intuitively good? Would I want to be my opponent in this position? In other words, am I, complete, com, am I creating enough complications for my opponent that their life isn't going to be very good, you know, and their they're not going to really enjoy this, and good things are going to happen. They're going to make a mistake. Now, we have to differentiate that from the hope chess that Warren mentioned earlier. This, some of the times the variations are so complex that Tao couldn't even figure them all out himself. He's just like, that looks good, I'm going to do it. It's intuitively pleasing to me. At least it's going to be an interesting game. And uh, it's cert they certainly were interesting. If nothing else, Tao was very good at using sacrifices to, to milk the, other, the opponent's clock. What I mean by that is so many times Tal's opponents run into time trouble. 
time trouble, time trouble, time trouble. Happened so many times in Tau won a lot of games because the opponent had to blitz out six, eight, twelve moves to meet the time control, and they didn't play accurately, and he exploited it, particularly after an adjournment. So, um, if nothing else, they created a lot of complications for his opponents. Now, let's look at another game where uh, Tau creates a complicated position for his opponent. His opponent runs into time control, and uh, Tal takes a nice win. This time was in the uh, World Championship, Botvinnik versus Tal in 1960. This is game six of the match series. Wow, thanks, Lucas. I was going to talk about a lot of that stuff. Oh, sorry. You stole my thunder, man. I mean, the only thing else I would add to that is that another reason his opponents got into time trouble a lot is because they knew they were playing tall. So they would be very careful before they played. Like, if you were playing Karpov, for example, you're not going to fear some kind of devastating sacrifice blowing you out of the water. But if you're playing tall, if you see, even see a possible sacrifice for your opponent, you're going to calculate that three times and see if you might even do it. And then you play your move, and he's still probably going to do it. But just that aura of who he was really intimidated people. And, of course, it didn't help that the crowd was almost always rooting for him. And... Apparently, people were not very disciplined back then. People were very loud, and I'll, I'll discuss that in this game with Botvinnik. It was actually the first time in, in chess history that, well, at least Kasparov claims anyway, that noise was such a problem that they had to actually take action during the game. And I'll, I'll show you what happens when we get to that point. So in any event, this is from their 1960 World Championship match, their first one. Um, Lucas hasn't mentioned it yet, but Tall was the shortest lived world champion. I think it was like a year and five days. The second, second shortest being Vasily Smyslov. But uh, it is kind of fitting, by the way, considering his chess style being so spectacular. You know, he was the shortest, brightest shining world champion ever, you could say. Right? The whole saying about bright stars burning out quickly kind of thing. Also, with respect to his life, too, short lived as well. But anyway, let's get started with the game. So Botvinnik was obviously happy to play his positional English opening. He was not interested in any kind of sharp theoretical debates. So here again we have a King's Indian, except this time Tall's on the black side. And at the time the theory of this was still developing. Now uh, in the last lecture we went over a game where Botvinnik actually played Bishop b3. But that was in his previous World Championship match with Smyslov. So this time, he had developed theory a little bit more, and he played h3 in order to prepare this move, bishop e3. Now, the whole point is that it defends against knight g4, so the bishop won't be bothered by that knight there. Now, queen b6. This is the sharpest move in this position, which, of course, black will play. And although Botvinnik played d5, it was later discovered that white has an interesting possibility in c5, although I'm sure Tall would have also been fine with this. The idea is that White has this interesting pawn sacrifice in e6. I think Tall would have loved playing either side of this opening. It's very complicated, and Shirov and Kasparov had some uh, debates in this opening in the 90s, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, d5 is just now known to be kind of a mistake. It gives black a lot of flexibility. And one of the reasons is it's kind of a pain for White to defend his weaknesses here. Now, uh, knight e1 is simply passive. Uh, a better idea would have been queen e2 with the idea of playing bishop e3. And the purpose of this is to guard b2 because right away, if, well, right away if bishop b3, b2 hangs. So that's the purpose behind queen e2. But anyway, uh, knight e1. And again, white wants to develop this bishop out to e3, but b2 still hangs. So rook b1. Yeah, rook fc8 was interesting. So uh, he discusses this. Now normally, Tall would have played a move that you might suspect like knight e8 or knight h5 followed by f5, right? Going for a direct attack on the king. But Tall decided that it would be a, a psychological victory to just play on the queen side. Kind of like, uh, he didn't phrase it this way, but when he talked about... Uh, 
keeping both Vinnick antsy, I pictured like Jaws music. That was a kind of uh, mm -hmm. feeling of uh, that I envisioned anyway. Trying to kind of disillusion him into being relaxed somehow. So this move is kind of annoying because, um, yeah. So Queen e2, London Knight takes g3. So you can't play that here. So bishop b3, queen b4. Now I can play queen e2 safely, guarding this b2 pawn. Now finally we see black come through with f5. Now I would like to play g4, but rook on b1 is under attack. And now we come to a, a critical point in the game. So um, the best move here is probably uh, knight f6. Just bringing the knight back into the game, avoiding the g4 fork. And black has a great game here. White doesn't really have any good active possibilities. Um, taking a7 is risky because of b6. And this bishop's going to be trapped. So white doesn't really have any active possibilities going on here. but. Taller side in a very risky move, and this is when the problem started at first in the World Championship history. So he played knight f4. So in return for the sacrificing this knight for a pawn, black opens up the dormant bishop on g7 and sharply changes the character of the play. Now, apparently the crowd went nuts when Tall played this. Apparently people were literally shouting and yelling and hurrahing and all this crazy stuff. and. But Vinnick's face turned red and he got upset and told the Arbiter that it needed to be moved to an isolated room. And eventually the Arbiter was able to get the crowd to quiet down and stop shouting and yelling so much. So of course, Bot Vinnick was not happy about this. So of course White must take the knight. And here, here is an interesting point here. So it, although this sacrifice is not all that bad. It's not entirely sound either. Now it turns out the strongest move here for white is actually a3. The reason may not be obvious. So white's idea is that he wants the black queen to move, say like uh, queen a5, so that he can play bishop d2 and not lose his pawn. Now if black insists on attacking b2, now white can actually take this guy. Now white's idea is that the bishop won't be trapped. It looks dangerous because black can play b6. But white luckily has this move a4 here. And it's a pretty remarkable resource. So white's idea is that after, say, rook, rook c7 attacking the bishop, he has rook a3 and knight a2. This rather ridiculous resource that Botvinnik overlooked. What about um, rook four c seven? So rook four c seven. Rook a three knight a two. I think the same idea works. Um, rook a three, queen c four loses because white trades and takes b six, and on queen b four, I think this works all the same. Queen d four. Queen d4. Rook takes. Rook takes. Queen e8 is certainly tempting. You know, white may even try queen a6 here. Queen f2 runs into bishop takes b6. Thanks, thanks to white's deep foresight, this rook defends the king. I can't believe he didn't see this. <laughs> yeah, this. I, I don't. I definitely do not blame Botvinnik for missing this. Uh, it's certainly not easy to see over the board, especially amongst a shouting crowd. Right? Probably felt like the whole place was rooting against him. Someone sacks a piece and they start cheering. <laughs> not the most heartening thing in the world. In any event, we'll forgive Botvinnik for missing this. But yes, this is one of those cases where a tall sacrifice was unfortunately not so correct. 
it turns out that what, what he played is still okay. It's just not as good. Now rook b1. And now another remarkable move. So black to play. Bishop e5? Uh, bishop... <clears throat> yeah, uh, bishop e5 is interesting. I think it does not work because of queen takes e5. And then white can take on b2, or if black tries his wish and zug, I think white's still doing okay. I'm not entirely sure, though. Uh, it might just be something as simple as bishop f3. But uh, Tall played f3. And here is where it got it bad again. The crowd went nuts again even though the Arbiter told them to be quiet. And they were just yelling and shouting, and they wouldn't shut up. So the Arbiter actually had to move them to an isolated room. First time in World Championship history, they had to put these guys in an isolated room where the crowd wouldn't shout them. Shout at them, I mean. So after F3, they had to, to I don't know if they had a set, set up somewhere else, but they had to take play elsewhere. So Bavinik was pretty pissed at this point, as you can imagine. Were they all masters that they could see, you know, what he's trying to do? Does right here just see, okay, Bishop takes on. I have no idea. I, I don't like that. I mean, they, they were probably just, like, you know, typical chess players. Though they, they would see, you know, they'd see two queens hanging on the board. they get excited, you know. Typical Russian, so. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not my first reaction when I see a sacrifice to go, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing there's some kind of vodka flowing around. I don't know, but yeah. Any event, people were way too excited. So he took the queen, but uh, it turns out uh, Bishop F3 actually works just fine. Now I, this turns out to be actually winning for White, although it's not simple. And I don't remember exactly how many years later it was discovered, but it was not known that this was good for White immediately. Now after the, in this situation now. If black plays queen a3, then white has the resource knight b5. And black's in trouble because white's going to play queen e6, take on d6, and white is attacking the black king now, as well as forking these rooks. So queen a3 does not work. So queen c2 is forced. And here is where they discovered bishop e4. So black's hand is forced here, unfortunately. The queen's trapped. So rook takes e4 is forced. But now white can play in the spirit of tall with knight takes rook. And the point is that after queen takes rook, white is threatening a mating attack here. The smothered mate, right? Say black plays a move like, uh, I don't know, rook b8. White has the, the classic mate, right? So black has to sacrifice. Oh, yeah. So now after knight takes d6, black has no choice. And here, white's threatening queen e8 mate. And so black's hand is forced. He has to trade queens here. But unfortunately, the end game is now won. This d-pawn is going to cost black the bishop. But we'll also forgive Bofnik for missing this variation. I mean, it is obvious after all, right? <laughs> if the people in the video can't tell I'm being sarcastic. See, so yeah, Spot didn't see this, so he just wanted to trade queens desperately, stop the crowd from shouting, you know, all that good stuff. Unfortunately, now this, this little black e pawn is going to spell big trouble. White's already having difficulty just not losing material here. Now, if uh, Black were to play Rook A1, then how would Black proceed here? Uh, Bishop D2. That's interesting. I think White can take and play Rook E1. Rook C3. 
Uh, one second. So bishop c2, rook b2. Yep, rook takes c3. Yeah. And then rook d1, yeah. right? And white's in big trouble, right? There's no way to stop this pawn from queening. So unfortunately, white's cast gets some material back. So knight takes pawn. But it's a pretty, ugh, it's not a very fun end game. Black has two bishops, and white's king is very weak here. At this point, it's just a matter of converting the win. Black's that past deep on is the difference here. So what is White trying to do here? If he kind of knows it's all going downhill, is he just trying to look for a mistake or something? Well, uh, or if, if just... you're White, I mean, you're going to try to somehow trade or win this deep on. I mean, it's kind of hard to find counterplay for White in this position. I mean, honestly, he, Botvinnik could have resigned at, at this point, probably. probably. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he was probably just playing because he was upset at the crowd, honestly. <laughs> he probably wanted to make them suffer and not see a quick end. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing how, you know, chess players don't want to be the first one out of a tournament hall when they play. You know, I don't think he wanted to give the fans the satisfaction of a quick, tall win. I don't think he wanted to read about that in the papers. And now this outside pass C pawn is, is too far away for White to catch. And after giving the check, Pop Bennick resigned. Yeah, because of this match, for the rest of the match, they had to play in an isolated room because all the fans were so un, unruly and freaking out about this game. So yeah, this is this kind of environment, if you can envision, this this tall guy staring and Botvinnik red faced and fans shouting after tall sacrifices. These this is the things that chess players dream of, right? Occasionally you'll see it at Starbucks around Houston, but not not usually typical at that level they play at. Alright, so I'll turn it back to Lucas. So one of the reasons that that match was remarkable is because it allowed Tal to take a four points to two lead. So you see after game six, Tal has two wins, four draws, and Botvinnik has four draws. And, um, and so Tal established a pretty good lead that he largely retained. Uh, you'll see that Botvinnik won matches eight and nine, and if you're a Botvinnik fan, match nine is, is very pretty. But for the remainder, uh, Botvin uh, Tal was... I don't want to say dominant, but he, he secured a win. They didn't need to play it past the 21st game. They didn't need to play the remaining three games because Tal reached 12 and a half points, thus securing the championship. And, um, you know, Tal didn't, he doesn't gloat about this in his book. In fact, he discusses the match and then he just moves on to the next tournament. He doesn't talk about, you know, being world champion and, how people viewed him and, you know, fans or this, that, and the other. He just says, you know, after this we played, played a, you know, another tournament and, and other people thought I shouldn't be playing at a tournament as quickly as I did, but, you know, I just wanted to play. So he, he moves on. Um, now, you should know that Tal had some health issues. In fact, most people don't know because they rarely see pictures of his uh, right hand, but he had a deformed uh, deformity in his right hand. He had a, a congenital uh, disorder where he only had three fingers on his right hand, although he was uh, still a very good piano player, actually. Um, the story, the, per his third wife, Angelina, apparently what happened is his mom uh, was taking potassium chloride, and I'm not a physician, so um, I don't know the, med the medical science behind this, but taking potassium chloride during pregnancy, but injected it intramuscularly instead of intravenously. And because of that, she suffered complications in her pregnancy. I'm not sure that that caused his congenital disorder of the hand, but he had some issues, most notably being his kidneys. Uh, he had a kidney ailment, uh, he called it colic, but essentially infections that led to one of his kidneys being removed in 1969, actually. And because of these ailments, and it wasn't just kidney disease, it wasn't just his deformity of his hand. He had scarlet fever a couple of times. 
he was ill quite a bit. Uh, he drank and smoked a lot, although his wife, his third wife, said that that wasn't the problem. Um, so he had a lot of health issues, and obviously dying at age 55 is, is kind of young by, by today's standards. And this impacted his chess in many, many ways. In fact, he was ill in the lead up to the 1961 return match with Botvinnik and had considered asking for a postponement, postponement but the president of FIDE said that um, to do that, he would have to get a letter from a physician um, selected by Botvinnik, the challenger, saying that, you know, Tao was unfit to play. And, and Tao was like, well, that sounds like a lot of paperwork. I don't want to deal with that. I just want to play. So he played, and um, he did get uh, further ill and was actually hospitalized during that second match and, um, and took a couple of rest days that he was allowed to take. But the match did not go as well for him. Now, it did not just have to do with Tao's health. And Tao would be the first person to tell you that. He also credits Botvinnik's preparation. You may remember that Smyslov dethroned Botvinnik to take the chess championship and that Botvinnik won the return match a little over a year later. Botvinnik came back prepared. He knew the ins and outs of Smyslov's style and he used it to win convincingly. He did the same thing against Tao, actually. See, Botvinnik and Tao had not played very much over the board. You remember the USSR championship cross tables, you didn't see Botvinnik's name there. So Tal had a little bit of an advantage because he had grown up looking at Botvinnik's games. He knew his style. And um, he had studied him thoroughly and Botvinnik was no slouch when it came to preparation, far from it. Um, but Tal had the advantage, I suppose, of understanding Botvinnik's style a little bit better than Botvinnik understood Tao's style, at least in the 1960 World Championship. In the 1961 World Championship, that was not the case. Botvinnik came in prepared, and um, you'll see at the very beginning, you know, it was kind of back and forth, but you'll see by about uh, game 11 or so that Botvinnik has a very commanding lead and just kind of has to preserve it all the way through the end and ends up winning by, by five points. I mean, that's a big margin for a 21 game series. So uh, Botvinnik came back and played excellent, excellent chess. And even though Tal thought that he played very well in the second half of the match from like game, uh, game number, I guess, 12 onward, he thought he played really well, Botvinnik earned it. So um, that was the last time Tal was world champion. That was the last time he competed for the world championship. He did not make it through the candidates in any other um, for any other world championship cycle, although he came close all the way until 1985. So he stayed relevant in the world chess scene for a long, long time. And in fact, some of his strongest chess may have been in the 1970s. See, in 1969, he had one of his kidneys taken out, and after that, he went on a tear. From July 1972 through April 1973, did not lose a single game. 86 games, which is the second longest streak in chess history, even to this day. The longest streak is also his, starting in October of 1973 through October of 1974. 95 unbeaten games. So Tal was on, you know, a very, he was at another, like a second peak. His his strongest series was, or, or time in his life was probably, as I said, 1960. But he had a resurgence in around 1973. Um, and so many people thought that he would be a potential challenger to Fisher. Now, and then when Fisher vacated, or when Fide uh, took his title away because he wouldn't play uh, the following World Championship Series and, and awarded it to Karpov, and then Karpov played Korchnoi and Karpov won, um, many people thought that Tao would be next. And that never really materialized. Um, he was never quite strong enough in the candidates' matches to do that. Um, but he stayed relevant and he stayed dangerous, and we're going to see that in um, in part three here. But before we get to that, let's look at our last uh, match of the evening, which is uh, from 1962. Ooh, and I just completely jumped over it. From 1962, this is uh, Tall playing uh, Hesht, who I'm not familiar with. I'll turn that over to Warren. This game has one of my favorite stories. Another ridiculous. Uh, chess event happening and I'll tell you when we get to that point 
involves Miguel Nidorf, who is also kind of an interesting character himself. So, this was played in 1962 in, I forget the name of the city, but I had no idea where it was. I think it was somewhere tropical. Um, wait, let's go ahead and get started. So this was not one of the top players at the time, although he was he was probably the equivalent of a strong IM or weak GM of today. So we have the Queen's Indian defense. Wow, it's like Alright. <laughs> I didn't blame anybody. I didn't blame anybody. All right. So this is all pretty typical theory, although black soon deviates a little bit. All right, now, uh, from what I understand, modern day three recommends g5, followed by bishop g3, knight e4, and black strives to maintain this acting on e4. Now, this is probably the best strategy. But in the game, black just decided to take on c3, which it gives white some additional possibilities, as we'll see. Wow, OK. Yeah. So part of the problem with not trying to occupy the c4 square is that white can develop a big center himself, as he does with knight d2 followed by f3. Wow. All right. So now that you're in this position, what would tall play? And you can't sacrifice a piece yet, so don't, <laughs> so don't go there. <laughs> I, I spoke too soon. I'm not creative enough. As brilliant as that move looks, I, I'm, I'm going to say he probably didn't play that. B5? B5. Oh, we're tall here. You think tall is going to want to close the position? <laughs> no. Exactly, yeah. Open up the position. C5 makes perfect sense. Turns out it's maybe not the strongest move here, but it does make a complicated position out of it. So, black has little choice. Now, um, I say little choice. B takes C5 doesn't make sense in this kind of position because it gives white's broken open file for free. So that's why... Oh, dang it. All the way. So that's why he took with the D-pawn. Let's go back. Now D takes E5. So now we go from a position where both sides have a couple center pawns to now White has the center pawn majority, right? Queen A4 check and one of those nuisance moves. And Black didn't reply very accurately. Now it turns out Black could have tried to punish white here by playing knight 6 d7. Now the idea is that after something like say queen c or yeah this is right queen c2 knight g6 black's doing fine here. Now tall evaluated this position as as white had good attacking chances but you know Kasparov disagrees and so does Houdini. So and frankly, looking at this position, I don't really see much for white. After, say, something like knight c4, queen g5, and black's doing fine here. Black has a nice blockade on these center pawns, so they're not going to run away from him. But black did not find this, probably also because he didn't see what white was planning on doing. Now thinking like tall, what do you think white would play here? Five. 
What was that? D5. Yep. Trying to open the position. <laughs> now what can White do? Now depending on your answer, you may or may not be kissed by Miguel Nydorf during the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Supposedly Miguel Nydorf was watching this game and after Tall played that, he just kissed Tall on the head. <laughs> I can't imagine having been his opponent and just watching this happen. <laughs> Yeah, the, the point is that Black's king is stuck in the center here, and, it's, <laughs> and the queen is not as important as opening lines up towards the king. Now, B.A., and now, how does White proceed? Yeah, rookie one is possible, but if, for example, rookie one, Black can castle, and <clears throat> Black's out of there. Yeah, first you take on G7. Keep that king stuck in the center. He can't castle either way. And the rook's under attack. So there's a little choice. And now what? <coughs> Did you say rook AD1? Um, rook AD1. I'm not sure. I, I think black can take this bishop. Yeah, rook e1 is okay, but after knight takes h4, I think black is going to survive this. Knight a5. Knight a5. Again, I think black's going to take this bishop. <laughs> That's probably going to be my answer to every white move, except the one that works. <laughs> <laughs> Out of spite. No, I, I think if bishop g6, uh, does queen take c4? Does black survive? Oh boy, that's close. Hmm. This is interesting. I'm looking at this, trying to figure out if black can survive or not. What about uh, instead of that rook playing the uh, rook on A to D1? Here? Yeah. I think black can take this. Okay. Well, probably. oh, maybe not. Uh, if takes, then this is uh, this is problem, right? Hmm. <coughs> oh, maybe black is saved by this, rook g7. Yeah, okay. Gives black a little bit too much time. Um, one. Yes, rook e1, this is... Rook e7. Yeah, this is looking rather... Light and black's mating here, right? Or white's mating, sorry. So, yeah, I do not think black can take that knight. I'm wondering if he can just take this guy, though. Rookie oh, one, rookie six. <coughs> This is close, but unfortunately, it looks like black gets away. Well, you can go into an endgame, but. Yes, but uh, it looks like black can try to defend this. Say, rookie two. This is not at all clear. For example, knight takes c5, rook b8. Oh, not rook b8, knight d7. I'm not 
sure. I have a feeling Black has a defense here. Although he may just have to go into that endgame. What happens if he takes Fisher? Here? Yeah. If the idea of Rook takes Pawn and then... Oh. oh, this might actually work. Okay. I'm not sure. This is... Oh, you got the four, nine, five, five, nine, four, oh yes. Well, yeah. Well, it's kind of forced, though. I mean, I've seen the play. Yeah, I don't see any other options. It looks like Black is forced to go into this end game. But it, I think Black is, you know, it's definitely not clear, at least to me. But regardless, white has much stronger here. Oh, but you got five? Yes, yes. This is the point. White wants to get that queen off the e-file. Oh, wow. At any cost, right? Now if queen f5, white can just take and take an f5. And if queen c4, how does white proceed? Which rook? Uh, a. Rook A? No, no, F. Rook F, okay. Now Queen E6. Rook E6. Okay. Only full credit if you see the mate. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, tall. Just works sometimes. Alright, so rook takes, f takes, bishop takes, probably, right? Uh -huh. King d7, rook d1, <laughs> right? Now say, say king c8. Bishop f5. No? Hmm? Yes. Rook d8, yes. And black cannot stop that pawn from queening. So bishop f7 I think is less clear after rook takes g7. Right. So king c7. Now what? Okay, bishop g3. And what if what if now king c8? Bishop takes bishop. Yes. And yeah, now rook g7 runs into bishop e6. Black has to give up the rook to avoid immediate mate. So king b6. Now what? <laughs> That's probably how most opponents reacted to Tall. Hmm? Rook, 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 rook B1. Rook B1. Yep, Rook B1. And King A6. Bishop D3. And mate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Tall did not see any of this. Until after he played Bishop F5, probably. Yeah, very pretty. And basically all forces we saw. Or else white queens, right? So going back, so this is why he did not take the knight. Instead, he just went took the other piece that was hanging. <laughs> but now, unfortunately, white's going to get a decisive uh, material and positional advantage here. So again, Paul has rook, knight, and bishop hanging. So how do you solve this problem? Ignore all three. Go for the mate. Hang another piece. I wish that were the case. <laughs> You can't attack other people's pieces. <laughs> Do you play like rookie one and then with the idea of rook d1 afterward? Or rook 81? 
a rookie one, I think Black can take this knight. Right, but can you have rook eighty one? Yeah, but then why doesn't oh, have a knight to sack yeah. anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, white must be precise here. Typical tall position. One move wins, all else loses. Of course, these are the kind of positions you like to put his opponents in. Now, if knight f5, then black takes, followed by taking the rook. If bishop f7, then rook takes g7. Probably defend everything with bishop c4, right? Yep, that's it. And this way, he either gets bishop against knight or retains a knight. So it works out well. And I, th and Hecht was tired of the knight, so he got rid of the knight. Although now white has, or is going to anyway, have a decisive material advantage here. Black's pawns are all doubled and weak. Not a single one can defend each other. It's pretty horrendous. Another nice tactic, right? Attacking the rook. He just likes to hang pieces, I think. <laughs> So as you can see, even though Tall was a hell of a tactician, he could also play an endgame. He was not so bad at converting things either. And here he wins with the shot rook g5. So the idea is that if black takes, which he must because otherwise white queens, right? But unfortunately black has the wrong d pawn. Now here it might not actually matter since white has an extra f pawn, but uh, in general, if you have a pawn on the seventh rank, it's a draw if it's a rook pawn or a bishop pawn. And it's a win for the side with a queen if you have d, e, or b. That may not be obvious to you, but it's because of the resulting position. So for example, we'll play it out. So say d3, g7, or whoops, is this right? Oh, OK. Yeah, it turns out this position, you don't run into it, but uh, white just trades queens and wins. White's point here is that he has queen b3, followed by marching the f-pawn. But I was referring to, say for example, black played a5 and was about to queen this pawn. Then this d-pawn you can't win with because after, say, this, black's king must go in front of the pawn to guard it, and white can bring the king one step closer. And white can always do this. Now, if we imagine the pawns in the corner, and I can uh, change the position like that. So, say black had this kind of position. Whoops. Now, if we have this sort of situation, white's in prob uh, has a problem because White cannot move the king closer because it would be stalemate. Oh, sorry, let me get rid of that other black pawn. So after white moves the queen off that file, then, or not there, say here, then black's ready to queen the pawn again. So the rook, rook pawn draws because of that reason. Now, the f pawn draws for a different reason, f or c. If we're in this situation, and white checks, right, trying to force the king to step there, black can actually step away from the pawn. Because in this situation, it's again stalemate. If white takes the pawn, then the black king has nowhere to go. But yeah, in this case, it turned out to be neither. But I think that's good information to know about those end games. It's just handy, so you don't have to calculate it all out. But yeah, so that, that's the only chess game I've heard of where somebody got kissed for making a move during the game. So. Yeah, that, that was a fun game. And I'll give it back to Lucas to finish it off. All right. Correct slide here. 
we're nearing the end, I promise. All right, so I mentioned that uh, Tal was followed by the KGB. And uh, you probably know that the KGB was a, a pretty active security apparatus in uh, Russia and in the, in the USSR at the time. There's Vladimir Putin, by the way, spying on uh, Ronald Reagan when he was visiting Moscow, posing as a tourist. I think that's kind of comical. Um, Tal depended on the government for a couple of reasons. First, obviously, his job depended on um, his job being a teacher, I should say, and as a chess player, depended greatly on the government. The government at any time could have decided that they were going to relieve him of his teaching duties, he'd be without a job. They could decide that he was, wasn't going to play in tournaments and he would not play in tournaments. And at times, they did flex that muscle. In 1970, Tal, who has won the USSR championship at this point five times, and it, who has been mandated by Moscow to move or by the, the government to move to Moscow from Riga, he declines to do that. He says, I, I don't want to move. So as punishment, they forbid him from participating in the USSR championship in 1970, which was hosted in Riga, his hometown. So they could and did flex their muscle. Another example is when he did, when he was able to travel international tournaments, which was not nearly as much as he would like, either his wife or his daughter or both had to stay home as essentially insurance that he would not defect. They were hostages, if you will. So he very rarely got to travel with any of his family as, as, as he's traveling internationally. Instead, he'd, he'd be gone for a couple months, come home and uh, visit with his family, have a big stack of mail to go through. So. There's a couple things Tal did to try to alleviate some of the pressure. One thing he did is um, Karpov was advanced by the Soviet Chess Federation as a successor to Fischer. And they pressured Tal to work with Karpov, and Tal did. Not necessarily because of the pressure. You know, he was a pretty amenable guy anyway. But you have to remember that, they're ba that the Soviet Chess Federation is basically saying, okay, Tal, we don't want you to be a world championship candidate. The future is Karpov. That's a pretty tough blow f to the ego for most people. And I don't know that most people, at least professional, you know, former world champions, would be able to take that blow uh, with grace. But, but Tal did. And he worked with uh, Karpov. He later worked with Kasparov. And he basically transitioned from this from this guy who was former world champion and gone through a couple of really impressive unbeatable streaks in the early to mid-70s to someone who by the mid to late 70s was grooming the next generation of chess master. So that so one thing he did is he worked with Karpov and you may remember when I was talking about the Soviet chess machine that um, many of the Soviet players were coerced into helping Karpov. Remember Botvinnik was kind of bitter about that. Um, now I haven't really talked about Tall's family because he doesn't really talk about it very much. He was married three times. First two marriages lasted, each lasted less than two years. Uh, he did have a son with his first wife. The wife and the son ended up defecting to uh, Germany in 1970, so Tall didn't really see him much anymore. Um, he had a daughter with his third wife named Zana, and uh, he stayed with his third wife Angelina for 22 years until he died, so their, their relationship stayed strong. Zana became quite good at chess, played some tournament chess as well, but her interest kind of lied elsewhere. So she's, um, the Angelina still lives, is still living, she lives in Germany. Uh, Zana, I'm not sure where she's at these days, but there are a couple of, uh, there are a couple of interviews with her on the web that you can find. Um, so he, he was a, um, a loving, attentive father. It's interesting, somebody once asked him, um, is the fact that you had a father, is that a detraction from your chess? Because if you think about all the other former world champions, only Smyslov and only, um, and only Tal had fathers who were present in their lives. Remember when I talked about Ayakin, I talked about his father being the governor of a region, hardly ever being home, didn't really you know, look after him at all, and did that instill a hunger in him? Well, he says, I don't know, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Um, some people have posed that theory before. Um, but he was determined to be present for his, you know, for his children, and he, he was. Um, and he was determined to be present in chess uh, as long as he possibly could. In 1988, 
at the age of, he would have been 51, he won the World Blitz Championship. He, and this was uh, against a field that included both Karpov and Kasparov, strongest players in the world, tall wins. He stayed strong in Blitz for the rest of his life. You remember that um, Bodminik played one game of Blitz in his life, hated it. Tall was quite good. He played second in 1970 tonight at Bobby Fischer. They had a world championship then, and then he won it in 1988, and he participated in several other years as well and always did well. He was, as you can imagine, so, as someone who played intuitively. He could play very quickly and very accurately and very frustratingly for his opponent. He won the final against Vaganian, was his name, 3.5 to 0 0.5. He crushed him in the final. Um, so he stayed strong through the remainder of his life. In fact, in 1992, about a month before his death, he basically left the hospital, you know, where he was uh, quite ill, and played in a blitz tournament and beat Kasparov in blitz. And then he died a month later. So, um, he, and he was, you know, and that was part of his love of the game. But it just goes to show that he stayed really strong. It's not like Al Yakin, who really declined post 1937, 1938, and at the end of the year, after the end of his life, he had health problems and he really wasn't playing at world championship status. I mentioned Tal was a strong competitor in the 1985 Canada's tournament. He was blitz champion in 1988. He took a blitz or blitz matches off of Kasparov in 1992 at the age of 54. He stayed quite strong even despite his health. Um, he did pass away in uh, 1992 at the age of 55. None of the men in his family really lived that long. They all uh, like I said, were fairly short-lived, including his uncle, his older brother, his father. And none of them lived beyond their 50s. So um, genetically speaking, that was, uh, that was pretty good. And considering how he lived in terms of his boundless energy and his playing through illness and his heavy drinking and his heavy smoking, um, it's, it's somewhat of a wonder that, that he competed and played at such a level for such a long time. Petrosian said something on the order of, if any of us had been as ill as Tal had been, we wouldn't have made it a year. You know, that he had this mental fortitude that he could play through this, continue on, and obviously he did better when his health was good. But he had a uh, remarkable career and a, a remarkable legacy for the game of chess, despite all that. And I, I think that's what sticks with us. People say genius, people throw out the word fireworks when he played, people throw, throw out the word magic, and he was certainly an inspiration to, you know, uh, the next generation of, of chess players and the one following that, that we see up and coming now. So um, I don't have a work cited for you because the website was being obnoxious, but I relied primarily on Tal's autobiography, as I mentioned, published in 1975 and updated in 1992 after his death, and also on Kasparov's work on My Great Predecessors. I did not rely on Sasanko. Um, as I have for previous lectures. Sasanko has a theory that Tal's real father was actually his uncle Robert. And I, you know, his wife doesn't really agree with that. And, um, and there's really no evidence for all that. So I didn't want to get into those theories too much. So I didn't use those books. So I kind of chose and censored what I, what I wanted. But these are the resources I found helpful. And this book in particular, um, it's, after reading it, it's probably up there in my top five of best chess books ever written, maybe even higher. Some people rate it number one. I, I wouldn't go that high, but it's, it's, it's quite a good work, so I would, I'd certainly recommend it. And as always, we'll stick around and answer any questions you might have. Yes. So that was like a month-long tournament or something? Yes. I'll show you. Uh, this was the, pull it up in the web browser. Yes, they played somewhere like, different tournaments were done different ways. Some of them were round robin. Some of them were Swiss system. And the, uh, the Swiss tournaments didn't seem to be as long. They were only like 12 or 13 rounds. But the before they moved to a Swiss system, there was something like 19 or 20 rounds. Everybody played everybody else. So in this one, there was 21 rounds. So because of that, yes, the the matches, you know, with it's rest days. Same five hour 
Yeah, they would have adjournments, and then there was one time where Tal actually had three adjourned matches simultaneously, and he had to do them all in one day. He had to finish his adjourned match against one player, and then finish his adjourned match against another player, and then he had, and then his third adjourned match was against Spassky, and he was hoping to like push it off to a third day because he didn't want to play Spassky, you know, after finishing two adjourned matches, but it turned out he had to do that anyway. So sometimes he had to finish up to three adjourned matches in one day. So this was an example of a round robin. Let me see. I think this one was a Swiss. Try to open that one so you can see that the, the Swiss ones, they, they had like 130 competitors in the field, so obviously it was impractical to do a round robin, right? That'd be somewhat... Uh, Suicidal, but it was a it, you know there's a Swiss system and, and Tao won or 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 shared the lead in um, in many of them. Though that was also a round robin. Let me go up to this was 1978. No, was it the 1974? Shoot, I'm sorry. There was one of these. At least I thought that was a uh, that was a Swiss. I guess there we go. There's that. So it was only one of them that was that he won. That was a Swiss, um, and he tied for the win there with Polyugayevsky. Same Swiss records. Is a capitalistic way of doing chess pairing. <laughs> well, it's I guess it's more egalitarian though because you include more players. So um, so it was played different ways, and you see this was a lot shorter tournament. This was a little over only about two weeks. Um, so. They were played different ways. The World Championship matches, obviously, those were over the course of like three months. Yeah. Other questions? Well, the the World Championship matches they reached a time control at five hours, and then they'd adjourn, and then they could continue on another two or three hours after that. I'm not sure of the exact time control, but the total match length could be anywhere from. Um, from an hour, if they, because there are a couple times where Tal says they they had GM draws, you know, kind of like I guess uh, uh, in the World Championship Series between Carlson and, and remember, uh, yeah, Anna, and it was like Game Two and Game Three. They had quick repetitions and they agreed to draws. They had a couple of those that would last, you know, 15, 20 minutes, and then they get an extra rest day. But they could be they could be five, eight hours long, um, and Tal had pretty good endurance for that. Um, obviously, he'd get have to get up or and walk around and smoke, or he had nervous energy that he had to get get out. But uh, he was certainly fine with with uh, games lasting that long. When you said five hours, did you mean five hours per side? Or did it have no, five hours total before they had the adjourn. Yeah. So I guess they both started with I think, and that they had to at least get forty moves each in those five hours, and then they could adjourn. Some of the games against Spassky lasted 90, 100 moves each. You know, some they had really, really long games. And um, Tal talks about, you know, um, losing those games or drawing those games or winning those games and, um, and how exhausting they were. But, uh, you know, you had to get up and play the next day just, just like, you know, you had a 15-minute draw, essentially. A couple times Tal talks about where he wasn't feeling well and he played like four or five moves and offered his opponent a draw, you know, just because it would help the opponent out and, um, and he, he needed the rest. And there was a time or two where his opponent refused and Tal went on to win spectacularly. And he's, he's like, well, in hindsight, I guess I'm glad they refused the draw. You know. Yeah, nowadays in, in, uh, in place of the Germans, since they can't do that anymore, uh, they do what they'll have is sudden death time controls. So you'll have, say, for example, two hours for the first 40 moves, and then you'll have like an hour for the rest of the game. So that's what they'll do instead of the Germans. Yeah. They don't do the Germans anymore because of computer analysis, basically. Oh, yeah. Then they appeal. Yeah. Yeah, at the time, it was just the quality of your second and your team. And Tal does talk about the quality of Botvinnik's team, that Botvinnik was extremely good at analysis and surrounded himself with people who were extremely good at analysis. And Tao was always somewhat weary about adjourning against Botvinnik. He wanted to get him in time control trouble, but adjournment was, you know, he knew that, that Botvinnik's preparation for the, um, for the uh, continuation of the game was just going to be solid. Oh, 
Oh yeah, back, back, back in his day, there was not such a thing as a chess playing computer. Yeah. But even nowadays, I don't think. Yeah, they would because. Unless there was a lot of money. Yeah. Well, you you if if. if if you want to think about it this way, that the strongest human player, Carlson's 2850, 2870, computers are up there at like 3,300 in turn if they were ranked in a FIDE rating. Really? Yeah, there's, 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 well, they, there's no GM on the planet who could beat a computer in a tournament match series these days. I mean, Vishian and the former world champion said he couldn't even beat his phone, you know. <laughs> It's that, that's just the state. I mean, it, it really changed with Kasparov in the 90s. I think the days yeah. of jobs against computers are not exist anymore. Yeah, it would take it would take almost perfect play from a human GM to, to get a draw against a computer. And and at adjournments where there aren't as many pieces on the board, a computer could very easily take it to a depth of I don't know 36 moves, perhaps. You know. Uh, whereas a, a human would be hard pressed to, to do half that, you know. I think we need to move to like a picture random chess thing. Yeah. That wouldn't solve the problem. It wouldn't. Though. That just has to do with preparation before a match. Yeah. I mean, the Germans, they don't like to do them anymore because then it would come down to who has a stronger chess playing computer or who can memorize the most lines. Mm -hmm. Because really, what computers change about a German analysis is that you would know that your analysis has no holes. You can analyze with the computer, you can analyze a 10 move line, and if, as long as the evaluation is what you want it to be, then you know it's correct. You don't double check it. So it makes it almost pointless now. To be people just reciting pages of their analysis. Yeah, it's almost impossible to, I mean, at least for me, to imagine the pre computer era when you, know, you had adjournments and you were checking with your seconds and your kind of group of friends, you know, who, who you brought along with you to the match. And for Germans, it was, it was certainly true that whoever, that having a team was super important. These days, not so much. You know, it's, it's good to have a good second. It's good to have, you know, people around you that are supporting you, but it's not as necessary. It's a side note, uh, you know, still about computers. You know, wouldn't it be a cool match to have 10 GMs against one computer and they all analyze? Wouldn't matter. No. It probably would make it worse. They would never agree among themselves. <laughs> yeah. Group stuff. I think it doesn't work as well as the the egos of all those grandmasters could not fit. <laughs> Depends on the GMs, maybe. Yeah. So, if there are no more questions, we'll stick around, obviously, to, to chat if you like. Next month, we're going to be talking about Tigran Petrosian, who, uh, by request. Um, world champion, won it from Buffenick, right? And stayed, yeah. stayed world champion for quite a while. Yeah. Um, very, very s strong player. After Petrosian, we'll probably get to, it makes sense to get, go to Fisher, so we'll, we'll have, uh, that'll be an interesting one. But not to diminish from, from Petrosian, obviously. So that'll be uh, probably on the last Wednesday of August. You know, keep an eye out for the calendar.